So welcome everybody to today's special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today we are delighted to have Professor Peter Stone as our speaker. Peter is the David Bratton Jr. Centennial Professor, University Distinguished Teaching Professor and Associate Chair of Computer Science at UT Austin. And is known for his contributions to reinforcement learning, multi-agent systems, planning and applications to robotics and autonomous traffic management. He is best known for his work on robot soccer and was behind the winners of 15 Robo Cup championships. He's the recipient of the Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, the ACM SIG AI Autonomous Agents Research Award, the Sloan Research Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and is a fellow of the AAAI, IEEE, and AAAS. Today, Peter will tell us about efficient robot skill learning via ground simulation learning, imitation learning from observation, and off-policy reinforcement learning. Please welcome Peter So. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, for the very kind uh, introduction um, and for inviting me to, to be here. It's a, it's a real honor. I know you've had a fantastic lineup of, of speakers um, and uh, so it's an uh, you know, honor to be, be presenting to, um, to IAS. Please, um, please do let me know if my sound cuts out at all. Um, and I'll, I'll use a backup um, method by, by phone or something, but hopefully this will be smooth. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I've, um, you know, I know uh, there's great, great things about the place. A colleague of mine, um, uh, Adam Clivens, of course, is spending time with you there this, uh, this year. And uh, I've been hearing from, uh, from him what a, what a great place uh, IAS um, is. So, I'd like to uh, like to speak to you about uh, several different things. This is a rather long title that I've given, and um, it's actually quite likely that I won't get through all of the the things in this in this title. I'm actually sort of uh, I know this is the um, a seminar on on theoretical machine learning, um, so my talk may be a little bit out of the the usual of what you you usually um, have, but I've sort of enhanced, uh, I've added some, some material on off-policy reinforcement learning that is on the more theoretical side that I'll get to sort of in the middle of the talk. And it may be that, that that makes it so I don't get to the imitation learning from observation part. And if that happens, I think that's fine. Um, do feel free to interrupt me as I, as I go, or you know, of course we can uh, have discussion and, and questions at the end. So uh, I'm gonna start by, you know, sort of uh, from a more applications perspective, and as Kay said in the introduction, sort of, you know, a, a lot of my research is motivated um, by uh, robot soccer and other applications like autonomous driving. And then I'll move, you know, into some more um, sort of technical al algorithmic material and then sort of some, some theory on, on uh, off-policy reinforcement learning. But the, the question that sort of unifies all the different things that I do in my lab is the one you see on this slide. It's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and their adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? And so I'm going to give sort of a one-slide uh, introduction to, to myself and my research. I don't know all of you um, ahead of time. So, um, and to give the, the one-slide introduction, I can't really, it's more difficult to give the, the um, theoretical and algorithmic um, uh, sort of contributions that we've that we've made, but I can give an overview of the general research areas, which is um, within AI, autonomous agents, multi-agent systems, and uh, and robotics, which will play a, a big role in this talk, as well as within machine learning, especially uh, we focus in my lab on on reinforcement learning, which I know you're very familiar with. Um, and then some of the motiv motivating application domains for me have been. Um, things like robot soccer. So these are some fully autonomous robots. I know the video is a little bit choppy, but these are some robots from about 15 years ago um, playing in the annual robot soccer competitions. Um, those were the Sony Ibo robots. Um, once those stopped being, uh, being made, we moved to these uh, humanoid robots, uh, the Now robots by um, Aldebaran. This is a, a clip from the finals of the um, one of the RoboCup competitions. Our robots are the ones with their, their hands behind their back. And again, I know the video is uh, choppy over Zoom. Um, but the point is that they're, they're sensing the world, they're deciding what to do, they're acting fully autonomously um, uh, as a team, 
here you see our robot going in on a on a breakaway um, in the in the finals against the team from the University of Bremen in Germany on the way to uh, to a victory. Um, where when we came back to the University of, of Texas afterwards, they lit the tower orange for us, which they usually only do when the when the football team wins. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, about RoboCup, but uh, another application domain that that drives a lot of my research is. Um, what we call uh, service robots, or what we, I call the building wide intelligence pro uh, project. If you come to um, my lab, you'll see robots like this one, just sort of wandering around the hallways. You don't have to ask us for a demo. They're almost always on. This particular video was some grounded natural language research that I did in collaboration with, with Ray Mooney on having the robot learn to um, improve its understanding of, um, of what humans, what people mean when they, when they give commands through dialogue. If the robot doesn't understand, then it asks questions until it finds the label of what the uh, initial uh, utterance meant and then uses that to improve its understanding um, in the future. But this is just one example of sort of the grand challenge of trying to have um, robots that are always on, a part of our environment, um, and you know, sort of being able to interact with people. Um, I also did have a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2007. Um, this is a picture of it. I won't show the, the video. Many of you, all, all of you have seen um, you know, uh, autonomous uh, cars these days. Um, we've actually retired the car that we had in the Urban Challenge, but we still think a lot about what the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. Um, and again, the choppiness here lo loses some of the effect, but, um, but this is sort of a multi-agent systems view of what you could do with autonomous cars, where instead of traffic signals, you have uh, the cars that are in uh, white have called ahead for a reservation to get through the intersection, and the ones that are in yellow don't have a reservation yet, so they have to stop before entering the, the intersection. Um, but once they turn white, they have a guaranteed path through the intersection that won't uh, intersect with any of the other cars. And, um, and we can you know, you know, sort of uh, prove some safety guarantees on this, um, assuming the cars are following the protocol. Uh, one of the first times I showed this, this video was at a conference in India, and someone said, this is what all the intersections look like um, there. But uh, you know, the difference is that, uh, of course, uh, we can, we can um, show that we've, we don't have, uh, don't have collisions in our case. Um, in any case, I could give a you know a full uh, hour long talk on any of these applications, um, but that's not what my plan is for for today. Um, I'll be happy to you know to uh, discuss them, but I want to zero in instead on on a, a problem that's motivated by these kinds of applications, in, in particular efficient robot skill learning. If we have robots playing soccer, robots in our environments, robots. Um, driving our cars, they need to be able to be equipped with skills. And, um, and so this, is, this talk will sort of zero in on the question of how can those robots uh, learn, learn skills. The I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into, uh, into the motivation through RoboCup because I think it's a fantastic motivation, uh, you know, sort of uh, application domain. Um, but you know, just about two or three slides on that. And then what I'm really gonna focus on in this talk is the problem of, of that's co um, come to be known as sim to real or um, uh, learning in simulation and trying to have that actually um, have impact and work in the real world despite the inevitable uh, gap between the simulation and the real world. The simulations are never perfect. So this is in some sense, um, at, uh, I'll, I'll introduce an approach that I call grounded simulation learning. Um, and they'll also spend a lot of time sort of drawing connections to off-policy reinforcement learning, where the, where the idea is that, you know, the simulator and reality, the real world, are different, so that you have to take a policy that you've learned in one setting and try to understand how good it is or will be in a different setting. And that's really the, the, the uh, crux of off-policy reinforcement learning as well. And so I'll show some of the sort of theory, theoretical results that we've um, achieved that are motivated by this. If there is time permitting, I'll also um, talk about another approach for efficient uh, robot skill learning um, that brings in some general, generative adversarial methods um, on imitation learning from observation. There's two algorithms that we've uh, introduced in my lab called behavioral cloning from observation and generative adversarial imitation from observation. But, um, but if I don't get there, you know, if I end up on, on this other part, uh, forgive me and then I'll uh, you know, follow up with, with people who have questions about that um, offline. Okay, so diving in, um, 
RoboCup Soccer. I'm actually the, the current president of the International RoboCup Federation, um, which has a very ambitious uh, goal, which is by the year 2050 to create a team of humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup soccer team on a real soccer field. Um, so this is sort of you know akin to um, to winning at chess or at Go or at Jeopardy, but now in a in a physical domain where you actually have to have robots on a field executing, you know, running, kicking, um, and deciding, and having the sort of uh, you know mixture of embodiment with decision making. Um, it's still relatively early. We still have a long time to go till 2050. Although you know the first RoboCup was in uh, the late 1990s. Um, there, if you haven't been to, to an event, I, I strongly recommend that you come, come to some uh, um, and, and see it. You can't really get a sense of it from just the pictures and the videos. But to give a sense, there are um, there's several different leagues there's, uh, that each have different um, properties. Um, the small size league, I'll, actually I'll show some, some videos of what they, what they look like. The thing they have in common is that they're all the robots are fully autonomous. So there is, you know, a, a league where people uh, where there's a full size soccer ball. There's a the small size league uses a golf ball. The standard platform league um, uses uh, robots that um, everyone has the same robot. This is from the early RoboCups, and you see the the robots really, you know, they're falling over, they're running into walls, they're um, they're not really looking great, but. Uh, but you know, this was in '97. This was a big achievement just to have the robots running and and not you know uh, at least not that often catching on fire and and things like that. Um, but if you jump ahead from from then to you know about ten years later, um, some of these same leagues, you see that the robots are much more individually competent. They have skills. They um, they're able to coordinate more and pass. Um, they're, they're more of, you know, more of a team. It was the beginning of the humanoid league. So that year down in the bottom right corner here was the first year that there was you know, sort of a penalty shot competition with, with humanoid robots. And now there's already, um, you know, full competitions with these, with these robots as well. Um, I should say these videos are not all my robots. This is a, a large community internationally. That's all sort of working towards this, this high level goal. Um, there's uh and then you know uh, one thing that will feature prominently in this talk is there is a league called the simulation league the 3d simulation league um our league has has or my team has has um done very well in this in this league we've won the championship eight out of the last nine years um this is what it looks like the the robot it's in a sort of physically realistic simulator um it looks a little bit like a video game except that there's not one program controlling all of the robots. Each one has to be controlled by a separate process. Um, and there is gravity modeled. So just getting them to walk and not fall over is a challenge. Um, and, you know, we've, and we've used both uh, machine learning to, to learn the skills of walking and kicking and things like this, a layered learning kind of approach, and also to um, do the teamwork and figure out you know, where should they go when they don't have the ball, what should they do um, otherwise. Uh, I said I'll say that this that will come back. We'll talk a little bit more about simulation in a minute. Um, just before I leave RoboCup Soccer, I'll, you know, I did say that the goal is to have people, uh, robots, be able to beat people in the year 2050. Um, every year now, we do have a, a team of of um, you know, myself and my uh, aging amateur colleagues, uh, all of us trying to to play against the robots. And, and so far we're still able to, to run and pass around the robots. So there's still a ways to go, um, but every year it gets a little bit harder. Um, just one last slide on, on RoboCup before I move on is, is uh, you know, it's not just about soccer. There's also um, uh, RoboCup at home, RoboCup rescue. Uh, we participate in my uh, lab in the RoboCup at home competition, which is really around this service robot concept about having robots be able to interact with people in, in restaurants, um, be able to put away groceries from a table, be able to interact with people, take commands, take out the trash, uh, unload a dishwasher, things like that. And again, these are all skills that, um, that robots need um, to be able to operate. So that's sort of the, you know, the motivation for trying to figure out how can we use machine learning to, um, to, to endow the robots with these, these skills. And that leads to this concept of, of um, grounded simulation learning and instance of sim to real. And this is um, joint work with uh, 
several people, but, but most prominently uh, Patrick McAlpine, um, who is right now a postdoc at Microsoft Research, and Josiah Hanna, who recently graduated with his, his uh, PhD um, and will be a faculty at University of Wisconsin in Madison. So, um, you know, there, there's, it's been very alluring. Lots of people have tried to think about, can we do reinforcement learning on physical robots? Just turn on the robot, have, give it a, a reward function and have it learn to do things like walk or, or kick or, you know, interact with people or whatever. Um, and there's, of course, many challenges uh, that, that, um, you know, that, that uh, we come across. Reinforcement learning tends to have, uh, you know, require a fair amount of data. Um, but if you, you know, try to use, get lots of data on a robot, um, it'll just fall over. It'll start breaking. You have to manually reset it. Um, and, you know, wear and tear on the robot while it's learning will create, cause the problem to be very non-stationary. So it's, you know, also then tempting to say, well, we can't learn do all the learning directly on the robot, let's learn in simulation, where we can do thousands of trials in parallel, no supervision is needed, um, you, you know, they can, you can automatically reset the robot and the robots don't break. Um, and you can, you know, you can build a simulator where you could execute a policy from the real world, but, um, but in, in general, like, so here, here's like a, 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 a walk behavior that we trained in, in simulation on this robot that's you know, sort of somewhat um, representative of the of the real world, but then if we take it and execute it in the real world, yes, it runs. It, it's meaningful. You can send the commands to the joints, but the robot walks only about two or three steps before it falls over. It didn't work, right? The, and and that's not surprising because the you know the simulator um, the simulator wasn't perfect. And so that's that's the whole you know enterprise of of sim to real is trying to address or, or close this reality gap, the gap between um, the simulation and the and the real environment, and the idea they, is is that yeah you you have a simulated environment that can execute the same policy that's um, that's uh, deployed in the real environment, but when you execute that policy, when you send the same actions, you get different results, different states, different rewards because um, the simulator isn't perfect, and so you know. Some people will say, well, then let's just make the simulator perfect or let's make the simulator better. And there's, you know, there's research in that direction. Um, but I think it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's never going to, it's never going to get all the way to perfection. We're always going to have some sort of reality gap. And so um, there's a number of, of different ways of dealing with this. One is to uh, try to learn a more robust policy in simulation by injecting noise into the simulation environment. Um, with the idea that if a policy will work in a, you know, in, a, in either a noisy environment or in a, you know, sort of a robust, a, 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 you know, sort of set of environments, that hopefully the real world will be, um, you know, sort of reflective of that, um, of that noise, and that the policy then will be robust to the differences. And so there's a fairly large body of research in this direction, and then there's the other general class of approaches to sim to real is to take some data from the real world and to use it to improve the simulator. And in many cases, with the ambition of making the simulator perfect, um, the work I'm gonna talk about today is actually of that class where we are trying to improve the simulator, but with the realization or with the you know, sort of resignation to the idea that the, the simulation will never be perfect, and yet we still want it to be good enough to be able to make learning progress. And so that mo motivates this idea of grounded simulation learning. And the, um, it's an iterative process. It starts by executing a, um, a competent policy in the real world, then gathering some state action trajectories, using them to ground the simulator, and I'll define what I mean by that in the coming slides, taking that grounded simulator and doing some policy improvement, taking a policy improvement step um, in simulation, taking that improved policy, executing it in the real world, and then continuing again through this loop once again. And with the idea that the simulator may, um, is going to be good enough in the region where you're searching in policy space to take a step along the, the gradient in the, pro, in the right direction, sort of like a trust region kind of idea. Um, but then when you re-ground the simulator, it may get worse where you were before, but hopefully better in the place where, you've not, where you now are in policy space. And so that's the idea. So the key here is, well, how do we ground the simulator? We ground the simulator um, 
you, uh, it, you know, to ground the simulator, what it really means is you want to take a policy and have such a, have, make it so that the actions that come out of that policy have the same effect in the simulation as they would have in the real world. And so you could imagine just replacing the simulator entirely. We instead take an approach that treats the simulator as a black box. And it's often the case that either you know, the, the simulation is um, not accessible to you, to the internals, or even if it is, even if it's an open source simulator, it's just way too complex to, um, you know, to, to go in. It's not differentiable. It's not, uh, you know, it's got tons of parameters. It's modeling all sorts of things. So instead, we're going to try to learn what we call an action wrapper, an action transformer that's going to change, ideally change the actions that come out of a policy, um, transform them into different actions such that the transformed actions when executed in the simulator have the same effects as the original actions did when executed in the real world. So in other words, we're not changing the simulator, we're just changing, uh, transforming the actions so that the effects will be the same. And so um, in a little more detail, the idea here is to replace um, any action with an action that produces a more realistic transition. And so we're gonna call the function that does this G, that's our transformer, it takes as input um, the current state and that current action and outputs a transformed action. And we actually, just to decompose this function a little more, we, we think of it as, as having two components, be, or the, being the composition of two functions. The first is a forwards dynamics model of the real world. So uh, a function that says, if I'm in state S and I take action A, what next state do I get to? Com composed with an inverse dynamics model of the simulator that says, if I want to get to state S prime from state S, what action do I need to execute in the simulator? Okay, so it's the composition of these, these two functions. The example I like to give is if like I, you know, if my, I'm thinking of, of uh, the, my, you know, sort of knuckle here is the joint that I'm trying to control. If it's at a 90 degree angle and I tell it to go to 180 degrees, in the real world, it may only go, you know, 20, uh, let's say, you know, 25% uh, of the way because the real world, you know, there's, there's a PID controller underneath it or something like that. Um, and in the simulation, if we say go to 180 degrees, maybe it goes, you know, 90% of the way. And so what we want to do is it, when the policy says go to 180 degrees, we want to instead replace that with the action to the simulator that only causes a 25 degree change, which might be move 30 degrees or something like that. So that's what the forwards dynamics model of the real world composed with the inverse dynamics model of the, the simulator can do for us. Um, so that's the idea. In practice, the way we do this then is we would learn the, we, uh, we use a deep neural network as, uh, as is the fashion these days um, to, uh, to train from um, a small number, a relative small, relatively small number of, of uh, real world trajectories. So if we take, you know, for instance, 15 um, examples of the robot walking forwards using a, using a competent policy. We can learn this sort of, you know, what are the effects of the commands on all of the joints? Um, and so that's this sort of lower part of the network. And then we can also uh, execute that policy in the simulator and see what happens. You know, we can get more, um, more trajectories in the simulator and we end up with uh, the, the inverse dynamics model and then we can train these um, and, uh, and end up with, a, you know, with, with basically the, the modules that we need for this grounded simulation. And um, to show you how this works, we, uh, in our initial, initial paper, we used basically uh, a one, the simulator I've already showed you, the RoboCup simulator, a more high fidelity simulator and some real robots. And we did sort of experiments transferring in all three different ways from uh, either simulator to the real robot or from the low fidelity simulator to the high fidelity simulator, um, where we could actually run lots more experiments because it's still hard to do lot, you know, a lot of experiments on the real robots. But I'll show you the ones that go from this C to A here, from the lower, lower fidelity simulator to the real robot. And uh, we started with a, with a competent walk that I'll show you in a minute from the University of New South Wales. It was actually the state of the art walk at the time. It was a hand-coded walk. Um, our policy search algorithm for how do we improve the policy in the grounded simulator, we used uh, off-the-shelf uh, CMAES, a stochastic uh, search method. And 
uh, basically a policy gradient reinforcement learning algorithm. It's, it's sort of in that family. Um, and so here's, you know, here's what it looked like. And the, the initial policy was, uh, like I said, the fastest known walk at the time on this now robot. It's able to walk a little over 19 centimeters per second. Um, and then we take one iteration through this grounded simulation uh, methodology, and we ended up um, with a significantly faster walk. You can notice maybe, um, again, the choppy video makes it a little hard, but it's sort of a little bit, it's learned to be a little more squat low down to the, to the ground. Um, and we then reground the simulator and then relearn in simulation in the grounded simulator and um, get to uh, what at the time was, was more than 40% faster than the fastest known walk on this robot. And you know, lots of people trying to get this robot to walk fast, all, all a part of the RoboCoop competition. So that's sort of the, you know, um, the idea of grounded simulation learning. And we first published this in AAAI 2017. Um, and, uh, you know, that did lead to the fastest known um, walk on the now. We've now, uh, I'm going to use this, though, as a jumping off point to, like what I, to what I promised at the beginning, is sort of a motivation, so a motivation of some more theoretical work that actually formed some of the core of Josiah's um, PhD thesis. There's, there's a, and then after that, I might come back to uh, the other questions here of extending to other robotics tasks or uh, addressing things like stochasticity in the environment and, um, and other sort of extensions uh, that, we've, that we've recently made. Um, but first, I'm going to draw some connections that I promised in the abstract and title of this talk to, um, to off-policy evaluation in reinforcement learning. And um, we've also... Uh, shown connections to safe learning, which is the idea of trying to, to um, learn a policy and be able to put the lower bound on how well it will perform when you move it into the real world. But I'm gonna focus on this off policy evaluation test. And the, the connection with grounded, grounded simulation learning is that you know, in, in GSL you have the simulation is, is uh, different from the real world. So you have a policy that's gonna be executed differently. Um, in off policy evaluation, we have instead that you, you have the same environment, but you have different policies. And you want to try to say from one policy, can we give some estimate on the value or the performance of this um, other policy that you've never executed before? And so um, to, to ground that problem or to, to specify that problem, um, what we're trying to do is estimate the value of a, of a policy in an in a MDP and in an environment, um, which is defined as the expected um, sum of rewards over some horizon, or if you'd like, you can have a discount factor and make it infinite. Um, given some trajectories, which we ref, um, ref, uh, denote as H here, trajectories of, ex of experience using that policy in your environment. Um, so, if, you know, in the robot walking case, that could be you have your policy, you're going to walk, have it walk several times and say, how good is that policy? And you'd like to be able to say, oh, 19.3 centimeters per second or 26 centimeters per second. Um, and, uh, and so policy evaluation is, you know, given some target policy, um, that you want to evaluate and data generated from a different policy, a different behavior policy. So just different mapping from states to actions. You want to estimate the value of this target policy, even though you've never executed it. And so we'll denote the, the estimate that we make of this, um, of this target policy as V hat. And the, the metric by which we measure the performance of an off-policy evaluation algorithm is the, the difference between the true value of your policy pi and your estimated value squared. And so we're trying to minimize this. The, a, a very common method for, for doing this is uh, in statistics, you know, in, in, that's all over sort of statistical methods is uh, important sampling. And this can be used for policy evaluation. Um, Important sampling is given your behavior policy, your trajectories, and your policy, um, you're going to, uh, to estimate the value of your policy by um, taking the total reward of each, for each trajectory, um, summing the total reward of that trajectory, and then, um, and then reweighting it by the relative likelihood in your evaluation policy, the policy you care about, and the behavior policy, the policy that generated the, the data. Um, 
and and then averaging the weighted uh, rewards over all of the trajectories you've seen. And um, and so uh, this is a this is a very general method. It was it's like I say it's you know been used in statistics in many ways. It was introduced to reinforcement learning by uh, in in two thousand. Um, but there remains some some sort of myths of, of important sampling within reinforcement learning. Um, and, uh, and we've, um, in a series of papers at, at ICML starting in 2017, we've, we've dispelled a couple of these of, of myths and countered them. And so the first, uh, the first myth is that if you're trying to evaluate a target policy, the optimal choice of the behavior policy to collect um, data for um, important sampling is the target policy itself. Okay, there's actually a, a statement in the, um, in the uh, introductory reinforcement learning book that, that important sampling estimates will lead to higher variance than if you use your, your true policy. And that's just not the case. This has been, like I say, this, is, this is, um, may not be surprising for people who, who are very familiar with important sampling um, in, in statistics, but it was generally uh, you know, thought in, in reinforcement learning that the target policy would be the optimal choice of behavior policy. And it turns out that, um, that instead, running a behavior policy different from the target policy can minimize the variance of these important sampling estimates. Um, and so we introduced an algorithm that finds a behavior policy that gives lower variance um, important sampling estimates. And it's a, it turns out to be a very general method um, that, can, that really we think everybody should be using if they're, if they're trying to do um, evaluation of a, of a policy. And so um, the, a sort of surprising or counterintuitive um, sort of, uh, you know, realization of this uh, or intuition here is that, is that important sampling can actually achieve zero mean squared error policy evaluation with only a single trajectory. Basically, with the, you, can have a, a, you can create a behavior policy that has absolutely no variance. And intuitively, the way to do that is to basically um, reweight the, the actions such that no matter which action you take, um, after you do the important sampling, you'll get the same reward, you'll get the same return. Um, and it's the true return you would get from if you ran the, you know, the, the, the true policy. Um, I have an example I can show if people would like to see, but, but you know, that, that's the intuition. Um, uh, the problem is you can't analytically determine the behavior policy that, that achieves this perfect evaluation because it requires knowing what the value of the true policy was is, is in the first place, and that's what you're trying to find. So you know it's, you need to know the solution before you could uh, you know before the answer um, or before before you start. Um, but once you start with this realization, you, you then we we can then um, introduce an algorithm that adapts the behavior policy towards this optimal behavior policy. Um, and the way, the way it works is basically chooses a behavior policy based on all the observed data so far in each iteration. So you could start with your, your target policy and just use that as your behavior policy. Um, but then in later iterations, you're going to try to change away from that. You collect trajectories using this new behavior policy. And then you estimate um, the value using all the observed data. And the, the point I want to make here is that the method we're introducing, it actually doesn't use new data to try to change the behavior policy. It's actually using the same data that it uses to evaluate our policy as it does to, um, to choose a new behavior policy. And so that's important when I get to the empirical results and compare it against Monte Carlo. It's really a, uh, an apples to apples comparison. Um, there, so, uh Yes. We have a question from Sanjeev. Um, the question is, could you clarify what notion of optimality you're using for important sampling? Yes. So the importance, the, the metric is, uh, is the one that I showed here, the mean squared error. So an optimal, um, an optimal estimate of the uh, policy will be the one that has um, minimal square error across, uh, from the, um, from the val true value of the policy. Is that the, is that what you're um, what you're asking, Sanjeev, or is it but, something different? But then you said that the the policy, the target policy itself, is not optimal. That's what doesn't it have zero mean square. Uh, so if you have if you knew the um, 
Yeah, right. So, so the target policy itself will have a variance. And so it doesn't actually have uh, the, the lowest mean squared error in terms of, um, oh, okay, so, so there's two different notions of, of, right, of optimality. There's the estimate you get. So if you run the true policy to infinity, it will be, give you the correct error, uh, give you the correct value, and it will have zero mean squared error in, in expectation. But along the way, it will have, it will give an error. So if, for instance, if you have a, a policy that, um, that 99% of the time takes an action that gives you a hundred reward, but 1% uh, of the time takes an action that gives you a negative 100, then as you're learning, there's gonna be a variance and the estimate that you get from running that policy is not gonna be the same as the true, um, the, the true value. And so you'll have an error in your estimate as you're going. And so the, the, uh, the optimal behavior policy is one that gives us um, the lowest mean squared error as you're, as you're learning. And, um, and the, the, in, in principle, like I said, there's, there's actually, there exists, a, uh, in theory, there exists a behavior policy that will give you the, um, the ideal uh, estimate right from the beginning after a single trial. And that the way intuitively, you know, for that example I gave, it's to, to very, to, to upweight the rare event um, to, and, uh, and downweight the, the more common um, action such that whichever one you choose, you get the true, um, you, after you do the important sampling reweighting, re you get the true value of the, of the policy. So there is a behavior policy that will lead to that after important sampling, even after a single trajectory. And so that's what we're trying to do is to get that, um, to get the mean squared error down as quickly as possible with as few trajectories as possible. Does that help? Good. Right, yeah, that's a great question though. So, um, good. So, so really what we're trying to do is adapt the behavior policy parameters with gradient descent on the, um, the mean squared error of, of, of important sampling. So um, it's really just a, you know, a gradient descent step that we're going to take if we can um, figure out the gradient of this, this, this error term. The point is we, we can't estimate the error, the mean squared error of our important sampling estimate because as it, you know, for the same reason I described before, it requires knowing the, the true value of the policy pi. But we can estimate the gradient of the, um, of this policy. And with, and the intuition for that is that the mean squared error of an, uh, of an unbiased estimator is its variance. So basically we're trying to, we, we're trying to find the gradient of the variance of our behavior of the important sampling estimate that is due to our, the behavior policy that we're currently using. And, um, and to do that, we, we uh, proved a, a behavior gradient, a behavior policy gradient theorem that we, we state as follows. It's that, um, it, and it looks a lot like the, the policy gradient reinforcement learning theorem. It's just the difference is that you, instead of the return being here, um, you have the squared important sampling estimates. So for those of you who know policy gradient RL, this looks fairly, fairly familiar. Um, but it's basically a way of, of showing that, that uh, it's a way of finding this, the gradient of the, um, of the mean squared error of the important sampling estimate. And, there, and then plugging that in, we can adapt our behavior policy towards um, the one with the minimal variance. Um, and so we can we can then test this. This is this is showing like you know, uh, and maybe this gets uh, Sanjeev at your question a little bit uh, as well. This is what ha the green lines here in two different uh, domains are what happens if we um, take a whole bunch of trajectories over time using Monte Carlo. So using the actual um, target policy as the behavior policy, this shows what happens to the mean squared error over time. So. The more samples we get, the lower the mean squared error, and it would avert, you know, in the limit would converge to zero mean squared error. Um, but if we use our behavior policy gradient, we're able to um, to basically for free with no extra data, just by changing the, the policy that we're using to try to evaluate the target policy and then reweighting using important sampling, we can do significantly better um, more quickly. And so that's the objective of this, uh, and and so that's sort of um, shows both theoretically and empirically that we can do better than when we're um, 
when we're evaluating a policy than just running that policy, but rather by uh, moving the, the policy that we're using to generate data towards a lower variance estimate of the, um, of the target policy. So that was the first myth of, of uh, RL sort of dispelled, RL important sampling. The other um, that I'll focus on here is that the true behavior policy should be used to compute the denominator of these importance weights. And so um, in, you know, counter to that, we actually find that replacing the behavior policy with an estimate of the policy that generates the data lowers the variance of the important sampling estimates. So, um, so again, this is a little counterintuitive. You, you'd think that if you knew the policy that was actually generating your data, you should use that knowledge to reweight the data. Um, but, it, but, um, but rather, we prove that, that using an estimated behavior policy has asymptotically lower variance than using the true behavior policy. And so in, intuitively, you're going to, um, if, if in the trajectories, there are some trajectories that happen more frequently than, the, than uh, were expected by the true behavior policy, then we're going to downweight them. And ones that happened less frequently, we're going to upweight them. Um, so I'll go into that in a little bit of detail here. Um, I have a question here. Go so ahead, please. You mean by the, uh, the true behavior policy? Um, I thought the behavior policy is just something that you choose um, as a proposal distribution, essentially, for the import section. That's right, it is. But but you still have when you when if, if it's stochastic, you still sample from it, right? So the behavior policy could be that I'm going to, you know, flip a coin and 50% go to the right and 50% go to the left. Um, yes. That's the true behavior policy. But then when you sample, when you generate from that, it's not going to be exactly 50%. You can it, it might be that you had 60% heads and and 40% tails. That's the that's the estimated behavior policy, and. Okay. You know, so, intuitively, you would you would want to just use the notion of the true behavior policy and say, oh, let, I'm going to you know assume that it was 50% each way, but but it actually turns out that's not the right thing to do. You're be it's better off taking a maximum likelihood estimate of the behavior policy, even if you knew what it was, and using that as the denominator in the important sample, which isn't usually done. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. So. Good question. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so how do we do this? So, um, so basically we just learn, we, we take the behavior policy, look at what actually happened when running that behavior policy, not what should have happened, um, which we know, but actually what you know, we, we can use supervised learning to learn the maximum likelihood per, uh, parameters um, that, should have, that would have generated that, right? So rather than the 50-50, the maximum likelihood was that it's a 60-40 coin. So we learn that using supervised learning. And then rather than using the true, it's a very simple method, rather than using the true behavior policy, we just replace it with this learned estimate. Um, and uh, we've done, we did this both for policy evaluation and then for, re, for more um, uh, uh, value function estimation for reinforcement learning in two different uh, ICML papers, including one just last, last month. Um, and taking this sort of you know, intuitive, uh, oops, in, intuitive method, the, the results here, we, we compared, um, these are a little bit busy graphs, but both in a grid world, which is discrete state in action, and in linear dynamical system, which was continuous state in action, where we compared against ordinary important sampling, which is the version that I uh, talk, uh, introduced here. There's also some improvements to in, important sampling, like weighted important sampling, weighted doubly robust important sampling, per decision important sampling. In each of these cases, if we just, um, replace the, uh, the true behavior policy with an estimated behavior, the empirical behavior policy, we get a, re a significant reduction in, um, in mean squared error, sort of quicker learning of the, the true value. Um, all, in all cases, except for this one here, the, the weighted important sampling in the continuous case, we're actually still better, but not by a statistically significant margin. Um, and so again, this is a very general result. It says that if you're trying to learn a a, um, you know, if you're trying to um, do off policy evaluation, uh, if you replace the true behavior policy with a maximum likelihood estimate of that behavior policy, you can correct errors due to the, sa the sampling error due to the action selection in that behavior policy. 
And, uh, and so again, this is something that just, we think everybody should be using. It's again, for free from a data perspective. And we've now in, our, in the most recent paper extended this to the on policy case, which, which where we show that even if you're um, not using, you know, you're not trying to evaluate using some other policy, but you're actually trying to estimate um, a, you know, uh, you're trying to starting with a behavior policy um, and using the same, the target policy as the behavior policy, even then you want to reweight by the empirical maximum likelihood estimated behavior policy rather than the, the true behavior policy. So um, that was sort of the, um, the more sort of, you know, uh, uh, theoretical deep dive um, part of this talk. I uh, introduced reinforcement learning, um, a couple of myths of important sampling in reinforcement learning. Um, that again, I think are, are parallel to things that are known in, in statistical in, in statistics, but but that we're, we're uh, not clear in the re reinforcement learning community. The first that the target policy is the optimal choice of behavior policy to collect data for important sampling, and the other is that the true behavior policy should be used um, to compute the denominator of importance weights. So neither of these is is true. Um, so in the interest of time, I think what I'll do here, now I, want, I do wanna talk about, I'm gonna pop back up um, and talk to, you know, go back to the, the grounded simulation learning um, method and talk about a couple of, just very briefly, a couple of um, recent extensions that are more again on this sort of applications driven side, um, but also that, that connect to sort of, uh, you know, sort of new algorithmic insights. Um, one is to try to build an action transformer rather than one that has a forwards dynamics model and an inverse dynamics model and composing them separately that does end-to-end -end learning of that an action transformer. And another that, that uh, addresses um, stochastic domains. And in fact, these are, uh, these are quite recent. Um, and so it's, I'm moving over to a different presentation. We just had both of these uh, ideas accepted to the main robotics conference or one of the main robotics conference, uh, IROS. Um, just a couple weeks ago. And uh, so this is a presentation and some of, some of my co-authors on this work as well. Uh, Josiah Hanna, Sid Desai, Haresh Karnan, both current PhD students and Garrett Warnell, who's a um, research scientist in the Army Research Lab and embedded in my lab. So the motivation here is, um, is, the same, is, is starting with this grounded stimulation learning result that I already showed you where the bottom here is, is uh, learn through grounded simulation learning. The top one was the, st the fastest walk prior to that. Um, we, you know, we've learned a faster walk, um, but there are, some, there are a couple of limitations. So um, in the method that I presented to you so far, the action transformer had this forwards dynamics model and an inverse dynamics model composed. Um, and, uh, and so we, we but, um, one thing then is it's just correcting individual steps. It's not actually correcting full trajectories um, and, and making a trend, you know, the, uh, correcting the sort of um, the actions in such a way that you get trajectories from the simulation that are the same as trajectories from the real world. It's just look taking that one step point of view. Um, and so in this work, we take sort of a different cut where we treat the grounding step as a reinforcement learning problem and trying to find an action transformer that will lead to simulated trajectories that match real world trajectories as opposed to single steps. Um, and then we can use a, a learned forward model to generate the reward signal of this RL problem. And so, um, you know, so just uh, again, I'm sticking with sort of the high level here. So just you know, to show uh, some videos of this working, um, we have a you know the first grounding step the the in this sort of hopper domain it'll it ends up falling over we iterate improve the the simulator um on the second grounding step it's able to to do a little bit better um and uh and and then finally it does better by the third the third step and then this shows that if we that that it's actually able to do better than um if we had just learned in the simulator or in um, using the existing method that was just making one step corrections, we were able to show that it that it can, can learn better trajectories. And um, we applied this also in the cart pole domain. We actually did some ex experiments where we said, what happens if we make the simulator and the real world be identical? Um, so that there is no 
you know, that we that there is no gap between simulation and real world. So the simulation is is the real world is actually the the same simulator as the simulation. Our past method we found, well, you'd like to learn a transform action transformer function that's the identity because there should not be any changes. Um, GAD actually showed some instability, and uh, over time the transformed actions diverged from the identity. Whereas this new um, sort of reinforcement learning method that's trying to keep the, the trajectories um, uh, aligned over time showed that we are able to keep much closer to this, uh, to this identity. And, and similarly, if we look at, uh, if we change the simulator or the real world, you know, the, the quote real world to have a heavier pendulum, one that's twice as heavy or twice as light, it learns to transform the actions in exactly the way you would um, you would expect. It basically downscales them um, for the heavier pendulum and upscales them um, for, the, for the lighter pendulum in such a way that it, um, that it you know, corrects, uh, corrects intuitively. So, so I, I'm, I know I'm staying at a very high level here, but, but this paper gives some insight into why um, the grounded simulation learning works and, uh, and looks at it from this more um, ongoing long-term perspective. The other recent uh, addition we've made in this in this method is um, applying it to stochastic domains. So, um, sort of the motivation here is that when we learned in the um, on the flat ground and then we put it onto a, a purposely um, bumpy ground, um, the the learned policy fails. Um, and so this there's like sort of foam underneath the carpet here that that makes it so that it's it's bumpier. Um, and the explanation for this is that the um, our current method that I that I presented um, grounded the, the grounded action transformation or grounded simulation learning. If you have a stochastic transition, will learn the maximum likelihood effect of an action. So if this state you know, zero from state zero, if you take action two, twenty percent of the time it would get you to um, state three and eighty percent to state two we were learning a deterministic function. And so it would learn that, um, that both action three and action two take you to state two, and it doesn't recognize this possibility of getting the higher reward because of a stochastic action. By augmenting the learned um, forward model to be able to handle stochastic transitions, we're then, we then enable it to learn this, um, you know, sort of a, a stochastic uh, grounding policy. And, um, and it makes a big a big difference in pro in practice when you have a more stochastic um, domain. And so, um, you know, in particular, the existing method would uh, would fall um, uh, fall over six or you know ten times. Um, it would move faster, um, but uh, but the stochastic method ends up being much more stable at a, at a small cost to the to the end speed. Um, and so, just to see what that looks like on video. Um, the ones on the, the right are using the old method and the ones on the left are using the stochastic method. And you see that you know, with, with the, the, the stochasticity in the environment really harms the, the original model and having the stochastic forward dynamics um, model allows it to succeed much more um, reliably. So, um, so that's the you know, sort of uh, where the, the work has, has been going recently on the more um, the uh, sort of empirical side. Um, so I guess I think I want to leave time for, for questions and I've already presented a lot. Um, the, the next part of the, the talk was going to be this the part of the title on imitation learning from observation. Um, I think rather than going into that in detail, I'm going to just really skim through um, just a, just the, the high level of it, and uh, just to uh, you know, um, and then I'll be happy to talk about it uh, offline. Um, but we have both a, a model-based and a, a model-free approach to imitation from learning from observation, where the idea, and this is collaboration with a PhD student and Garrett Warnell, where the idea is you're trying to take an expert trajectory, but where you only see the states, you don't see the states and actions. So most imitation learning, you know the states and the actions, and you're trying to learn a new policy that mimics the states and actions. We're trying to, to learn from just an observation of the states, um, what's a policy that will mimic that expert trajectory. Um, and again, I'm gonna just skip through uh, th this. Um, 
this part of the talk, we introduced two, two algorithms. Um, one is called behavioral cloning from observation. And then the other, which I will just spend one slide on, is a generative adversarial method um, that, uh, that basically um, takes the demonstration state sequences, a state and next state from the, um, from the demonstrator, and try, learns a discriminator that tries to tell the difference between that, that demonstration and a learned um, generated policy, which is policy pi here. So there's a generator that's learning a policy that when you, from a state, uh, take an action, leads to a next state transition, that you, can, that you then have a discriminator which is trying to tell the difference between the demonstrations and the imitations. And, um, and so this is sort of in the family of generative adversarial imitation learning algorithms, but it extends it to the case where you don't actually see the actions of the, of the demonstrator. Um, and again, I, I could, could talk a lot more about this and how it works and extends to the visual setting. Um, but I think in the interest of, of time and to, to, you know, respect, to uh, allow time for questions, I'll just um, I'll stop here and and remind people the the high level research question um, that, that sort of unifies things in in my lab. Um, we also do a lot of other work in reinforcement learning that I could talk about or multi agent systems. Um, but really, the theme of this talk was on efficient robot skill learning, um, especially on this grounded simulation learning and its connections to off policy um, reinforcement learning. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, a very little, uh, you know, sort of teaser at the end on imitation learning, um, imitation from observation. So, so let me stop there. If people do want me to go into, you know, any of these things I skipped over, I'll be happy to, but, but let me, let me uh, allow time for questions and thank everyone for your attention. Hey, let's thank Peter for the interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, I'll start off with one question. Um, so in the, um, the um, uh, methods, right, where you replace the uh, behavior policy with the empirical um, uh, estimates um, of that mm -hmm. policy, um, I wonder um, how that scales to large action spaces, because in large action spaces, I suppose um, one thing that could happen, right, is that you know, some rare actions may never be sampled, for example, right? So, um, would that cause any issues there? Yeah, so for the theory to hold, we, have, we do have to have um, the, uh, full support. So you have to have the same, uh, you know, um, it, it, every action needs to have been sampled at least once in the behavior policy that appears. Um, for the, uh, we, have, we have looked at cases where the support is not the same. Um, and so then it basically, you, you end up still with very high variance at the, at the beginning. And then once you get to the point where you've had all the actions sampled, then there's a quick drop in the in the variance, and you're right. In a high dimension, that can take longer. You still do see benefits empirically, and that's in our latest ICML paper from this um, uh, from just last month, where we look at the um, where we look at the uh, value function uh, version of this, not the policy evaluation version, which I presented here. Um, we do some experiments where the where you know you we don't we for quite some time during the evaluation. Um, there's actions that have never been sampled, um, and yes, it's it's you know there's a there's a noticeable knee in the in the results once you get to the point where the actions have been sampled, um, but there's still benefits all all along the way. So it's a great question. Um, it, it, you know the the power of the method reduces when you when you don't have the same support. No, you're right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we have one. Um, a few questions actually. Um, so the first question is, um, so let's see. So general adversarial um, imitation learning from observations looks very interesting. Could you share some experimental results or demo if any? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll again try to do it on the relatively quick side, but um, so uh, yeah, so I've, I gave the, the one slide in introduction to it. Some of the experiments we've done, we compare against um, Gale, which is generative adversarial uh, imitation learning, um, TCN and BCO. BCO is our own algorithm that, that, that I skipped over. Um, but all three of those are algorithms that have access to state and action 
um, pairs of the demonstrator. Um, and in Hopper, they, they do, you know, sort of varying degrees of, of performance. Um, we were able to, sh we were able to show that Gaifo does, you know, sort of, there's a, a little bit of a performance drop compared to Gale, um, um, but is able to do uh, relatively, um, relatively well, where zero is, uh, I should say, zero here is the random policy, and uh, one is the, um, the policy of the expert that we're trying to imitate. Um, the uh, the sort of raw version I showed you was was um, if it, uh, and those initial results was if we were learning directly from states so we see the the true states of the um, of the robot you know the joint angles that they're at rather than images um, but really the motivation for this is to learn from observation from just seeing what the expert is doing and so we also have a a vision stack version of this where um, what's the, the top part here is the generator. It takes as input um, if, uh, for a sequence of four states from the, from the hopper, um, uses a standard convolution architecture, outputs in, uh, an action that when you combine it with the state um, is then a discriminator tries to, d to tell the difference between the demonstrations from that state and the output of your policy, which again is a convolutional pipeline. Um, so very you know, similar idea. Um, but now, you know, the demonstration is literally just the pixels that I'm showing here where, you know, we don't get to see the, the joint angles. Um, we don't get to see the actions. We just see this video image. Um, and then the learned policy is able to, um, to mimic that. Here you say, see it doing that, you know, sort of qualitatively similar, um, similar behavior. And if we measure now against, um, TRPO that's also trained from vision, which is shown here as this dashed line. So the expert is doing, um, you know, th that we're that we're trying to imitate still has a higher performance. But if we look at, you know, what what's the best you can do if you just have this visual information, um, the competing algorithms actually don't do very well at all, and and we're able to do as well as as TRPO in this case. And so um, that's sort of a a quick. You know, run through of um, of GIFO, um, but where uh, and you know, there's there's still ongoing work here, trying to and including trying to to do sim to real transfer using GIFO on on real, uh, trying to get it working on real robots that will probably end up being a part of um, a part of Faraz's thesis. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Bella Gupta. Um, so um, um, so I guess the question is. Uh, so in our policy learning, essentially the important weights are used to correct for the policy mismatch. Um, now, um, is it conceivable that you can use the same idea um, to correct for sort of the same to real gap in the sense that um, you can use the important weights uh, to correct for the frequencies at which the returns are weighted, right? Depending on, um, I guess, you know, the frequencies that, that, that occur in the real world versus the, the simulation part. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I was thinking about that last night as I was putting the two parts of this talk together. As, as um, um, because I've you know I've given this talk before with it without nearly as much on the. Um, this is the first time I've presented some of these these theoretical results on the uh, on the op policy evaluation, um, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic idea to explore. It's something we haven't looked at, um, you know. But I, I think you know if we if we take a sort of, yeah, important sampling kind of view. Um, the, the, the difference is important sampling does assume that you have some knowledge of the behavior policy in some way of representing it. Whereas in the sim to real problem, the, the, you know, the simulator is different from the real world, but you don't really have access to this sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, action probability or the analog of, of action probabilities. Um, but if you, yeah, if, if you can, you know, sort of learn a, um, learn a transition function from the real world and the, and the, um, and a transition function for the simulator and reweight by the, the probabilities that, that you find from those, it, it might have, yeah, it might be able to, um, to have similar, similar effect. And, and to be honest, uh, it's a great idea. It's something we haven't um, we haven't explored so far, and and uh, sort of you know it's something that would be great for future work to try to connect these these threads a little more directly. 
Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, okay, so maybe let, let me ask another question. Um, so can you perhaps contrast, um, you know, your uh, behavior cloning versus general adversarial imitation learning um, and uh, perhaps comments on sort of, you know, the practical performance thing, gains that you observe in the general adversarial setting and, uh, you know, I guess the circumstances are under, under which the latter will be better. Um, between these, between, yeah, so behavioral cloning from observation, I didn't really um, present, but it's basically the idea is that the, in a nutshell, the idea is to um, run a policy in your simulator um, before you get your expert demonstration, learn a forwards dynamics model um, that says, uh, or sorry, an inverse dynamics model that says if you were in a state and you, were, and you get to a next state, what's the action? Um, that generated that, and then use that to infer the missing actions, um, and then to and then to repeat. Um, the yeah, your question is like when will each one work uh, work better? And um, I guess really informally, um, we've found that we're that the the generative adversarial method is more powerful in that it's it's able to do. Um, I mean, be behavioral cloning always is um, limited by, you know, you're only going to do as well as the, the, as the, dem the demonstrations. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, neither of these is an inverse reinforcement learning method per se. So, but, but GIFO, we find it does tend to um, be more robust and, and generalize better. So we've actually focused, uh, our initial results were in BCO. Um, we've... I should say for, for real robots, we found it easier to, to apply BCO like methods because you can do it with a relatively small amount of data. Um, the general generative adversarial method is, is required more data, but tends to give us better results and be more robust when we can use, when we can um, get access to that data. So this is very, you know, high level and informal. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we're, we've been, Focusing more of our attention on, on GIFO, except when we're trying to get something working on a real robot and we have some sort of derivative methods from this to, to get them to make that happen. So I can't really say too much more than that other than, you know, this sort of, um, yeah, sort of loose characterization. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have two other questions. Um, so um, the first question is from Punyan Jamshidi. Um, the question is, was there any difference between the transformation functions that you have learned with the one-step look-aheads versus when you replace the one-step with the RL approach? Um, and yeah. What have you gained from the difference? So actually, there's something I skipped over, which I can show here. It's, it, we haven't analyzed um, the differences in, in uh, detail. That's something we do, do need to do. But one thing that's um, important to understand is that the the learned uh, in the initial method, I'm sorry, I'm skipping through a whole bunch of slides here, but I'm going backwards. Um, I want to get to the point where I have the learned model. Um, oh, wait, where was it? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so the, um, this is the initial model of, of when we take a policy that walks in the real world and try to model it in the simulator. And it doesn't look right. It's not walking the same way it did in the, in the real world. And so our first question was, you know, how, once we do the grounding, how good is the model? And, um, and it turns out it's not much better. It doesn't look visually like it's fixed anything. Um, and so we did do some analysis and found out that it, it was, much better at correcting for some joints than other joints. Um, so it like, you know, corrected the ankle, but didn't correct, you know, some other, other parts. And so it's not at all, you know, the, the, um, this method, you know, the original method when it's taking the one step is not closing the reality gap. It's just making it so that the simulator is more, enough more reflective of the real world that when we do the learning, it takes us off in, you know, in the right direction. And so your question is now, you know, can we say something um, about, you know, if, if, can, can we show sort of, you know, similar analysis um, in, the, uh, in the trajectory case? 
And you know, that's very much on our agenda. But like I said, this is sort of hot off the press kind of results. We have not done that comparison yet. Um, my intuition is that we uh, that like in this you know one step case, it's still not going to make the simulator look right. Um, but uh, but I think it's yeah, it would be be great to be able to analyze how much uh, how much closer is it? Is it better? And that's um, you know we'll, we'll, we're uh, we're still in that analysis phase, so I don't have anything I can say about it so far. But it's a great great question. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Vikash. Um, so um, the question is, if we were able to do very well uh, in similar envir environments, um, can we use domain adaptation methods to transfer that learning? Um, let me actually, if that's in the chat, let me take a read yeah. that so that I can or digest it a little better. Um, um, I'm in to clarify your question. That would, would be great. Uh, so domain, I mean, in some sense, that's what this, uh, um, yeah, if I'm understanding the correct, the, the question you're saying, if we can learn well in simulation, can we improve the simulator, um, you know, uh, to, um, to do the transfer? That's, I mean, in some sense, that's what we're doing. We're doing a, d a domain adaptation, but in a very particular way. Um, we're, we're adapting, we're, we're sort of altering the action space or action, altering the effects of actions. But, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the questions. If you, yeah, if you want to, if you want to, if you think I'm missing it, feel free to clarify. Okay. Um, that's maybe that answer to this question. Um, thank okay. you. Um, are there any, okay. Yeah. So we did. All right. Okay. Great. Are there okay. any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank Peter again for the very interesting talk.